A Tiger's Skin by W. W. Jacobs, read by Melissa Marie. The traveling sign painter, who was repainting the sign of the cauliflower, was enjoying a well-earned respite from his labors. On the old table under the shade of the elms, mammoth sandwiches and a large slice of cheese waited in an untied handkerchief until such time as his thirst should be satisfied. At the other side of the table, the oldest man in Clayberry, drawing gently at a long clay pipe, turned a dim and regretful eye up at the old signboard. "'I've drunk my beer under it for pretty near seventy years,' he said with a sigh. "'It's a pity it couldn't have lasted my time.' The painter, slowly pushing a wedge of sandwich into his mouth, regarded him indulgently. "'It's all through two young gentlemen as was passing through here a month or two ago,' continued the old man. They told Smith, the landlord, they'd been looking all over the place for the cauliflower, and when Smith showed them the sign, they said they thought it was the George the Fourth, and a very good likeness, too. The painter laughed and took another look at the old sign. Then, with the nervousness of the true artist, he took a look at his own. One or two shadows. He flung his legs over the bench and took up his brushes. In ten minutes, the most fervent loyalist would have looked in vain for any resemblance, and with a sigh at the pitfalls which beset the artist, he returned to his interrupted meal and hailed the house for more beer. "'There's nobody could mistake your sign for anything but a cauliflower,' said the old man. "'It looks good enough to eat.' The painter smiled and pushed his mug across the table. He was a tender-hearted man, and once, when painting the sign of the Sir Wilfred Lawson, knew himself what it was to lack beer. He began to discourse on art and spoke somewhat disparagingly of the cauliflower as a subject. With a shake of his head, he spoke of the possibilities of a spotted cow or a blue lion. "'Talking of lions,' said the ancient, musingly, "'I suppose, as you never heard tell of the clayberry tiger,' It was a four-year time in these parts, I expect. The painter admitted his ignorance, and finding that the illusion had no reference to an inn, pulled out his pipe and prepared to listen. It's a while ago now, said the old man, slowly, and the circus the tiger belonged to was going through Clayberry to get to Wickham, when, just as they was passing Gill's farm, a steam engine they'd add to draw some of the vans broke down, and they had to stop while the blacksmith mended it. That being so, they put up a big tent and had the circus ear. I was one of them as went, and I must say it was worth the money, though Henry Walker was disappointed at the man who put his head in the lion's mouth. He said that the man frightened the lion first, before he did it. It was a great night for Clayberry, and for about a week, nothing else was talked of. All the children was playing at being lions and tigers and such like, and young Roberts pretty near broke his back trying to see if he could ride horseback standing up. It was about two weeks after the circus had gone when a strange thing happened. The big tiger broke loose. Bill Chambers brought the news first, having read it in the newspaper while he was having his tea. He brought out the paper and showed us, and soon after, we heard all sorts of tales of its doings. At first, we thought the tiger was a long way off, and we was rather amused at it. Frederick Scott laughed himself silly almost up here one night, thinking how surprised a man would be if he come home one night and found the tiger sitting in his armchair eating the baby. It didn't seem much of a laughing matter to me, and I said so. None of us liked it. And even Sam Jones, as had got twins for the second time, said, Shame. But Frederick Scott was a man as would laugh at anything. When we heard that the tiger had been seen within three miles of Clayberry, things began to look serious, and Peter Gubbins said that something ought to be done. But before we could think of anything to do, something happened. We was sitting up there one evening, having a mug of beer and a pipe, same as I might be now if I'd got any backy left, and talking about it. When we heard a shout and saw a ragged-looking tramp running toward us as hard as he could run, every now and then he'd look over his shoulder and give a shout and then run harder than a four. "'It's the tiger,' says Bill Chambers, and afore you could wink almost, he was inside the house, having first upset Smith and a pot of beer in the doorway. 
Before he could get up, Smith had to wait till we was all in. His language was awful for a man as had a license to lose, and everybody shouting, Tiger, as they trod on him, didn't ease his mind. He was inside almost as soon as the last man, though, and in a flash he had the door bolted just as the tramp flung himself again it, all out of breath and sobbing his hardest to be let in. Open the door, he says, banging on it. Go away, says Smith. It's the tiger, screams the tramp. Open the door. You go away, says Smith. You're attracting it to my place. Run up the road and draw it off. Just at that moment, John Biggs, the blacksmith, come in from the tap room, and as soon as he heard what was the matter, he took down Smith's gun from behind the bar and said he was going out to look after the women and children. Open the door, he says. He was trying to get out, and the tramp outside was trying to get in, but Smith held on to that door like a Briton. Then John Biggs lost his temper, and he ups with the gun. Smith's own gun, mind you, and fetches him a bang over the head with it. Smith fell down at once, and afore we could help ourselves, the door was open, the tramp was inside, and John Biggs was running up the road, shouting his hardest. We had the door closed afore you could wink almost, and then, while the tramp lay in a corner having brandy, Mrs. Smith got a bowl of water and a sponge and knelt down, bathing her husband's head with it. Did you see the tiger? says Bill Chambers. See it, says the tramp with a shiver. Oh, Lord! He made signs for more brandy, and Henry Walker, what was acting as landlord, without being asked, gave it to him. It chased me for over a mile, says the tramp. My heart's breaking. He gave a groan and fainted right off. A terrible faint it was, too, and for some time we thought he'd never come around again. First they poured brandy down his throat, then gin, and then beer, and still he didn't come round, but lay quiet with his eyes closed and a horrible smile on his face. He come round at last, and with nothing stronger than water, which Mrs. Smith kept pouring into his mouth. First thing we noticed was that the smile went, then his eyes opened, and suddenly he sat up with a shiver and gave such a dreadful scream that we thought at first the tiger was on top of us. Then he told us how he was sitting washing his shirt in a ditch when he heard a snuffling noise and saw the head of a big tiger sticking through the hedge the other side. He left his shirt and ran, and he said that, fortunately, the tiger stopped to tear the shirt to pieces, else his last hour would have arrived. When he had finished, Smith went upstairs and looked out of the bedroom windows, but he couldn't see any signs of the tiger, and he said no doubt it had gone down to the village to see what it could pick up, or perhaps it had eaten John Biggs. However that might be, nobody cared to go outside to see, and after it got dark, we liked going home less than ever. Up to ten o'clock, we did very well. And then Smith began to talk about his license. He said it was all rubbish being afraid to go home, and that, at any rate, the tiger couldn't eat more than one of us, and while he was doing that, there was the chance for the others to get home safe. Two or three of them took a dislike to Smith that night and told him so. The end of it was we all slept in the tap room that night. It seemed strange at first, but anything was better than going home in the dark, and we all slept till about four next morning, when we woke up and found the tramp had gone and left the front door standing wide open. We took a careful look out, and by and by, first one started off and then another to see whether their wives and children had been eaten or not. Not a soul had been touched, but the women and children was that scared there was no doing anything with them. None of the children would go to school, and they sat at home all day with the front window blocked up with a mattress to keep the tiger out. Nobody liked going to work, but it had to be done, and as Farmer Gill said that tigers went to sleep all day and only came out toward evening, we was a bit comforted. Not a soul went up to the cauliflower that evening for fear of coming home in the dark, but as nothing happened that night, we began to hope as the tiger had traveled further on. Bob Pretty laughed at the whole thing and said he didn't believe there was a tiger, but nobody minded what he said. Bob Pretty being, as I've often told people, the black sheep of Clayberry, 
what with poaching and what was worse is artfulness. But the very next morning, something happened that made Bob Pretty look silly and wish he hadn't talked quite so fast. For at five o'clock, Frederick Scott, going down to feed his hens, found as the tiger had been there afore him and had eaten no less than seven of them. The side of the hen house was all broke in. There was a few feathers lying on the ground and two little chicks smashed and dead beside them. The way Frederick Scott went on about it, you'd hardly believe. He said that government would have to make it up to him, and instead of going to work, he put the two little chicks and the feathers into a pudding basin and walked to Cudford, four miles off where they had a policeman. He saw the policeman, William White, by name, standing at the back door of the Fox and Hounds public house throwing a handful of corn to the landlord's files. And the first thing Mr. White says was, It's off my beat, he says. But you might do it in your spare time, Mr. White, says Frederick Scott. It's very likely that the tiger will come back to my hen house for the rest of them, and he'd be very surprised if he popped his head in and see you there waiting for him. He'd have reason to be, says Policeman White, staring at him. Think of the praise you'd get, said Frederick Scott, coaxing like. Look here, says Policeman White. If you don't take yourself and that pudding basin off pretty quick, you'll come along of me, do you see? You've been drinking, and you're in a excited state. He gave Frederick Scott a push and followed him along the road, and every time Frederick stopped to ask him what he was doing of, he gave him another push to show him. Frederick Scott told us all about it that evening, and some of the bravest of us went up to the cauliflower to talk over what was to be done, though we took care to get home while it was quite light. That night, Peter Gubbins, two pigs went. They were two of the likeliest pigs I ever seed, and all Peter Gubbins could do was to sit up in bed shivering and listening to their squeals as the tiger dragged them off. Pretty near all Claybury was round that sty next morning, looking at the broken fence. Some of them looked for the tiger's footmarks, but it was dry weather, and they couldn't see any. Nobody knew whose turn it would be next, and the most sensible man there, Sam Jones, went straight off home and killed his pigs afore he went to work. Nobody knew what to do. Farmer Hall said as it was a soldier's job, and he drove over to Wickham to tell the police so. But nothing came of it, and that night at ten minutes to twelve, Bill Chambers' pig went. It was one of the biggest pigs ever raised in Clayberry, but the tiger got it off as easy as possible. Bill had the bravery to look out of the window when he heard the pig squeal, but there was such an awful snarling noise that he dares not move hand or foot. Dickie Weed's idea was for people with pigs and such like to keep them in the house of a night. But Peter Gubbins and Bill Chambers both pointed out that the tiger could break a back door with one blow of his paw, and that if he got inside, he might take something else instead of pig. And they said that it was no worse for other people to lose pigs than what it was for them. The odd thing about it was that all this time nobody had ever seen the tiger except the tramp, and people sent their children back to school again and felt safe going about in the daytime till little Charlie Gubbins came running home crying and saying that he'd seen it. Next morning, a lot more children see it and was afraid to go to school. And people began to wonder what had happened when all the pigs and poultry was eaten. Then Henry Walker see it. We was sitting inside here with scythes and pitchforks and such like things handy when we see him come in without his hat. His eyes were staring and his hair was all rumpled. He called for a pot of ale and drank it nearly off. And then he sat gasping and holding the mug between his legs and shaking his head at the floor till everybody had left off talking to look at him. What's the matter, Henry? says one of them. Don't ask me, says Henry Walker with a shiver. You don't mean to say as how you've seen the tiger, says Bill Chambers. Henry Walker didn't answer him. He got up and walked backwards and forwards, still with that frightened look in his eyes, and once or twice he gives such a terrible start that he frightened us arf out of our wits. 
Then Bill Chambers took him, forced him into a chair and give him to a gin and patted him on the back. And at last, Henry Walker got his senses back again and told us how the tiger had chased him all round and round the trees in Plashett's wood until he managed to climb up a tree and escape it. He said the tiger had kept him there for over an hour and then suddenly turned round and bolted off up the road to Wickham. It was a merciful escape, and everybody said so except Sam Jones, and he asked so many questions that at last Henry Walker asked him outright if he disbelieved his word. It's all right, Sam, says Bob Pretty, as had come in just after Henry Walker. I see him with the tiger after him. What? says Henry, staring at him. I see it all, Henry, says Bob Pretty, and I see your pluck. It was all you could do to make up your mind to run from it. I believe if you'd had a fork in your hand, you'd have made a fight for it. Everybody said bravo, but Henry Walker didn't seem to like it at all. He sat still, looking at Bob Pretty, and at last he says, Where was you? He says, Up another tree, Henry, where you couldn't see me, says Bob Pretty, smiling at him. Henry Walker, what was drinking some beer, choked a bit, and then he put the mug down and went straight off home without saying a word to anybody. I knew he didn't like Bob Pretty, but I couldn't see why he should be cross about his speaking up for him as he had done. But Bob said as it was his modesty, and he thought more of him for it. After that, things got worse than ever. The women and children stayed indoors and kept the doors shut, and the men never knew when they went out to work whether they'd come home again. They used to kiss their children afore they went out of a morning, and their wives too, some of them. Even men who'd been married for years did, and several more of them see the tiger while they was at work and came running home to tell about it. The tiger had been making free with clayberry pigs and such like for pretty near a week, and nothing had been done to try and catch it. And what made clayberry men madder than anything else was folks at Wickham saying it was all a mistake, and the tiger hadn't escaped at all. Even Parson, who'd been away for a holiday, said so, and Henry Walker told his wife that if she ever set foot inside the church again, he'd ask his old mother to come and live with him. It was all very well for Parson to talk, but the very night he come back, Henry Walker's pig went, and at the same time, George Kettle lost five or six ducks. He was a quiet man, was George, but when his temper was up, he didn't care for anything. Afore he came to Claybury, he had been in the militia, and that evening at the cauliflower, he turned up with the gun over his shoulder and made a speech and asked who was game to go with him and hunt the tiger. Bill Chambers, who was still grieving after his pig, said he would. Then another man offered, until at last there was seventeen of them. Some of them had scythes and some pitchforks and one or two of them guns, and it was one of the finest sights I ever seed when George Kettle stood em in rows of four and marched em off. They went straight up the road, then across Farmer Gill's fields to get to Plashett's Wood, where they thought the tiger had most likely be, and the nearer they got to the wood, the slower they walked. The sun had just gone down, and the wood looked very quiet and dark, but John Biggs, the blacksmith, and George Kettle walked in first, and the others followed, keeping so close together that Sam Jones had a few words over his shoulder with Bill Chambers about the way he was carrying his pitchfork. Every now and then somebody would say, What's that? And they'd all stop and crowd together and think the time had come, but it hadn't. And then they'd go on again, trembling, until they'd walk all round the wood without seeing anything but one or two rabbits. John Biggs and George Kittle wanted for to stay there till it was dark, but the others wouldn't near of it for fear of frightening their wives. And just as it was getting dark, they all come tramp, tramp, back to the cauliflower again. Smith stood em arf a pint of peace, and they was all outside here, fancying theirselves a bit for what they'd done. When we see old man Parsley coming along on two sticks as fast as he could come. 
Are you brave lads a-looking for the tiger? He asks. Yes, says John Biggs. Then hurry up for the sake of mercy, says old Mr. Parsley, putting his hand on the table and going off into a fit of coughing. It's just gone into Bob Brady's cottage. I was passing and saw it. George Kettle snatches up his gun and shouts out to his men to come along. Some of them was for hanging back at first, some because they didn't like the tiger, and some because they didn't like Bob Pretty. But John Biggs drove them in front of him like a flock of sheep, and then they gave a cheer and ran after George Kettle, full pelt up the road. A few women and children was at their doors as they passed, but they took fright and went indoors screaming. There was a lamp in Bob Pretty's front room, but the door was closed and the ice was silent as the grave. George Kettle and the men with the guns went first. Then came the pitchforks and last of all, the scythes. Just as George Kettle put his hand on the door, he heard something moving inside and the next moment the door opened and there stood Bob Pretty. What the dickens, he says, starting back as he sees the guns and pitchforks pointing at him. Have you killed it, Bob, says George Kittle. Killed what, says Bob Pretty. Be careful of them guns. Take your fingers off the triggers. The tiger's in your house, Bob, says George Kettle in a whisper. Have you only just come in? Look here, says Bob Pretty. I don't want any of your games. You go and play them somewhere else. It ain't a game, says John Biggs. The tiger's in your house, and we're going to kill it. Now then, lads. They all went in in a heap, pushing Bob Pretty out in front of them till the room was full. Only one man with a scythe got in, and they wouldn't have let him in if they'd known. It almost made them forget the tiger for the time. George Kettle opened the door what led into the kitchen, and then he sprang back with such a shout that the man with the scythe tried to escape, taking Henry Walker along with him. George Kettle tried to speak, but couldn't. All he could do was to point with his finger at Bob Pretty's kitchen, and Bob Pretty's kitchen was for all the world like a pork butcher's shop. There was joints of pork hanging from the ceiling, two brine tubs as full as they could be, and quite a string of fowls and ducks all ready for market. What do you mean by coming into my house, says Bob Pretty blustering. If you don't clear out pretty quick, I'll make you. Nobody answered him. They was all examining ands of pork and fowls and such like. There's the tiger, says Henry Walker, pointing at Bob Pretty. That's what old man Parsley meant. Somebody go and fetch Policeman White, says a voice. I wish they would, says Bob Pretty. I'll have the law on you all for breaking into my house like this. See if I don't. Where'd you get all this pork from, says the blacksmith. And them ducks and hens, says George Kettle. That's my business, says Bob Pretty, staring him full in the face. I just had a excellent opportunity offered me of going into the pork and poultry line, and I took it. Now, all them as doesn't want to buy any pork or fowls go out of my house. You're a thief, Bob Pretty, says Henry Walker. You stole it all. Take care what you're saying, Henry, says Bob Pretty, else I'll make you prove your words. You stole my pig, says Herbert Smith. Oh, have I, says Bob, reaching down a hand of pork. Is this your pig, he says. It's just about the size of my poor pig, says Herbert Smith. Very usual size, I call it, says Bob Pretty, and them ducks and hens, very usual looking hens and ducks, I call them except that they don't grow them so fat in these parts. It's a fine thing when a man's doing an honest business to have these charges brought again him. Disartening, I call it. I don't mind telling you that the tiger got in at my back window the other night and took off a pound of sausage, but you don't hear me complaining and going on about calling other people thieves. Tiger be hanged, says Henry Walker, who was almost certain that a loin of pork on the table was off his pig. You're the only tiger in these parts. Why, Henry, says Bob Pretty, what are you a-thinking of? Where's your memory? Why, it's only two or three days ago you see it and had to get up a tree out of its way. He smiled and shook his head at him. 
but Henry Walker only kept opening and shutting his mouth, and at last he went outside without saying a word. And Sam Jones see it, too, says Bob Pretty. Didn't you, Sam? Sam didn't answer him. And Charlie Hall and Jack Minns, and a lot more, says Bob. Besides, I see it myself. I can believe my own eyes, I suppose. We'll have the law on you, says Sam Jones. As you like, says Bob Pretty, but I tell you plain, I've got all the bills for this properly made out upstairs, and there's pretty near a dozen of you as'll have to go in the box and swear as you saw the tiger. Now, can I sell any of you a bit of pork afore you go? It's delicious eating, and as soon as you taste it, you'll know it wasn't grown in Claybury. Or a pair of ducks would have come from 200 miles off, and yet look as fresh as if they was only killed last night. George Kettle, whose ducks had gone the night afore, went into the front room and walked up and down, fighting for his breath. But it was all no good. Nobody ever got the better of Bob Pretty. None of them could swear to their property, and even when it became known a month later that Bob Pretty and the tramp knew each other, nothing was done. But nobody ever heard any more of the tiger from that day to this.